So welcome, everyone. This is our uh, Spintronic seminar number 41. Uh, the speaker today is uh, Professor Karim uh, Jamsari. Uh, he is at uh, UCSB. Uh, he received his PhD in electrical and computer engineering from Purdue University in 2015. And then he stayed there as, as a, uh, a postdoc uh, until 2020, until finally joining the Department of Electrical and Computer Engineering at UC Santa Barbara this year. Uh, Karim's uh, PhD work established a uh, modular approach to connect a growing set of emerging materials um, and effects to circuits and systems um, and created a framework that um, has also been adopted by other people. And in his postdoctoral work, he used this approach to establish the concept of uh, P bits and P circuits as a bridge between classical and quantum circuits uh, to design efficient and domain specific hardware accelerators in the new er era of electronics beyond Moore's law. So his talk today will be about probabilistic computing with stochastic magnetic tunnel junctions. And I think it um, overlaps with a couple talks we, we had in the series earlier. So um, I think he'll um, connect um, to those topics um, as well. So with this, I'll give it over to you, Karen. Please go ahead and, and, um, and uh, start. All right, thank you very much, Kirill, for that introduction. And Thank you very much for this invitation to the wonderful online Spintronic series. It brought you know, this whole community together. And yeah, as Kirill mentioned, I recently joined um, UC Santa Barbara. So I'm looking for graduate students and postdocs. If you have interested people, please uh, direct them to my website. Uh, so a bit of an advertisement there. Um, hopefully this talk will connect to some of the nice talks that were uh, given here in this series, I'll try to connect to them when relevant as, as we go through. And I recommend you to go and go back and uh, look at those talks through the archive of the uh, OSS website. Okay, so um, th before I begin, you know, this is, this is uh, my wonderful set of collaborators over the years. Um, they, 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 you know, this, is a, this, is, this work is actually a, a collaborative effort. There are many students and professors, as you can see, so I'd like to acknowledge them before I start the talk. Okay, so uh, let's say a few words on uh, computing today before I begin. And uh, we're all familiar with the idea of a bit, okay? That is this deterministic object that, that is either zero or one. And this is the workhorse of digital computing. Practically everything we do is enabled by the bit. And what realizes the bit is this, um, these amazing devices that Moore's law have enabled. And you know, you look at uh, the field today, you'll see CPUs with billions of transistors that each express this bit. And you, you hear about GPUs, TPUs, all sorts of new devices with you know, uh, billions and billions of these transistors. Now on some axis, I'd like to put the qubit here, which is which is like an extreme. And uh, I'd like to put it on one end of the extreme, which is you go from determinism to, to quantum mechanics. And just to describe the qubit actually requires a technical definition. I have to use the word superposition because a qubit in some sense can become zero and one at the same time. And although you know, this can be misunderstood, this, this uh, underlies some of the very interesting things you can do with qubits. And this field, you know, even though the idea has been around for some time, at least you know, three or four decades, you see very recent activity from major players. IBM, you know, Google had this amazing demonstration recently with, with you know, a heroic experiment. D-Wave has been around for a while. So, so put to put qubits in terms of these hardware computers to realize them, this has been an ongoing effort with lots of progress recently. Now, one thing that is common that may not be obvious between the two, you know, bits and qubits, especially in this modern beyond Moore's era, uh, is this. It's this idea of domain specificity. Now, what I mean by that is, 
if you look at bits, as we approach physical limits and limitations in the physical dimensions of transistors, what you see is this idea of domain-specific hardware. What that means is you're not going to get, you make everything better by making smaller transistors anymore, but you're going to pick an application specific to a domain and you're going to use our existing devices in creative manners to accelerate them. And one example in machine learning that you're all seeing is the use of GPUs, for example. The GPU uses existing transistors, existing technology, but it's a specific circuit, a specific architecture that helps accelerate a certain specific application in machine learning, basically matrix multiplication in large volumes. And TPU is something you may not have heard of, but that is, that is another, that is this highly specialized application specific circuit that's developed by Google to sort of cater to their own machine learning software like TensorFlow. Now, in some sense, quantum computing is also domain specific, okay? And, and you can say that domain, quantum computers are not and never meant to be replacements for our digital uh, enterprise, but rather they would be good for specific things. And you know, one obvious example we can all relate to is the simulation of quantum mechanics itself. If you have a many-body problem, then it, it is most natural to use a quantum bit uh, for the computer so that everything happens naturally like this. Okay, so, what, so my talk today is going to be on something that is also domain-specific and that's going to, and, I, and I'm going to argue that it's in between the spectrum of bits and qubits. And um, qubits are absolutely not quantum mechanical objects. Let's make that you know, clear from the outset. They're not coherent, but they're not deterministic either. So in some sense, they're not perfectly classical, but they have inbuilt randomness and they fluctuate between zero and one. And this is also going to be a, you know, the applications of PBITs will also involve domain specific ideas. So PBITs are not meant to replace qubits or bits, but they are meant to serve as, as a, as a, in, in this specific role that uh, have uh, natural randomness in, you know, for applications that are naturally random. And I'll, I'll try to argue that, you know, there's a nice connection to a subset of machine learning algorithms that are naturally stochastic, the so-called stochastic neural networks. And also in quantum, we keep hearing about this NISC era quantum computers, right? The noisy intermediate scale quantum computers that basically classifies the quantum computers people have today. And I'll show you that the applications targeted by such NIST era quantum computers are those that can also be targeted by probabilistic bits because these applications of NIST era computers are not generally, um, uh, for example, like solving many body quantum problems. They're mostly focusing on things like optimization and sampling uh, and those come naturally to probabilistic uh, hardware as well. So before I you know, continue, if you're coming from a CS background, you know, something might be bothering you right away. And I'd like to make a concrete qualifier about that before we really go further. Now, one thing you realize is if you look at these objects, bits, p-bits, and qubits, you can immediately tell a nice niche application space for each of these units by just looking at their behavior. For example, what I mean by that is if you have bits and if you're trying to do something like exact matrix multiplication, you might be, you know, it's a good idea to use the bit because it's naturally deterministic. It is meant to do precise calculations. It can do it very fast and very efficiently. And as I was saying earlier, if you have a quantum mechanical problem like solving some uh, uh, quantum dynamics or some mini-body quantum Hamiltonian, then it makes sense to use the qubit because the problem itself has that, it shares that intrinsic feature. And that immediately gives you an application space for the pivot. And that's this use of uh, uh, random algorithms or randomness in machine learning and AI. So that gives a nice separation between these two objects, but that's not enough of a separation. And we'd like to, I'd like to say 
uh, um, uh, a few words if this is if this is bothering you and if it may or may not depending on your background but uh, he, here's the thought so for any problem you can define uh, an energy to, to solve the problem e and the time it takes to solve the problem tau and usually this energy and delay is a quantity whose product we'd like to minimize we'd like to so, you know use as small energy as possible and we'd like to do it uh, as quickly as possible. So, so a smaller e tau is, is, is a very good thing. And this has the advantage of having the units of h bar. So you can try to come up with, you know, fundamental theorems and try to say that, okay, uh, uh, how many h bars uh, do I need to, to solve this problem? And, and that's a fundamental quantity. And in fact, device engineers, when they come up with a device, like, like, uh, like compared to uh, CMOS, that's what they try to do. They try to chart this ETAL chart for different contexts. But there is a, a CS-like uh, thing here, and that is, that, that, is, that is this. The idea that the time and energy has a, has a problem, uh, an algorithm-dependent factor in it. Okay, and, and this is completely hardware independent. It's completely independent of what type of substrate or what type of material or computer or architecture you use to solve this problem. And here, and this, this here I'm showing it as something like an F of N and a G of N, a functional dependence on the problem size. And you say things like, okay, if I double the size of this problem, then the computation time, for example, changes exponentially or it changes polynomially, right? So this is, this is often very important to know to kind of, uh, in a broad way, separate problems that you could solve uh, with, with different approaches. Now, of course, there's also the very important prefactor, which is, you know, which sets, which puts real units onto, onto these quantities. And those are, of course, device and architecture dependent. And uh, in, you know, you could say that Moore's law was all about actually reducing E naught and tau naught, those prefactors. You didn't need to invent new algorithms to change F of N and G of N in this past five, six decades. So there's great merit in trying to find uh, prefactor reductions to make, to make things go faster. And this is in the field sometimes called as hardware acceleration. So that's like, if you hear the term hardware acceleration, what people intuitively have in mind is something like this, improving the prefactors rather than the uh, functional dependence. Now, the separation I wanted to make was in the case of quantum. For example, if you look at Shor's algorithm, you see something spectacular happens there. Actually, what is exponential for a uh, what's an exponential functional dependence for a classical computer becomes a logarithmic dependence if you solve it on a quantum computer. Now, Shor's algorithm is, you know, requires too many qubits, requires fault tolerance. It's not going to be solved by any quantum computer anytime soon, but this is a big difference between what the qubit is all about and what we are thinking of with, with qubits. Everything that I'll be showing here in this talk will be in the context of trying to reduce this E naught and tau naught. Because the idea is the functional dependence cannot change because anything you can do with a p-bit, you can simulate it with a pseudo-random number generator and do it with a bit, okay? But we will argue, and I'll try to convince you, that there is, there is actually a big penalty if you try to solve naturally random problems with deterministic hardware. But this is a very different type of speed up compared to quantum computers. So, so with that qualifier, now let me show uh, you uh, what type of problems have we looked at with probabilistic bits. So what is that specific domain that the pivot can be uh, useful? So uh, this is, as I mentioned in the beginning, there are two broad categories, quantum computing inspired and machine learning inspired. And, and you know, uh, th that's a broad, broadly two big categories. And in the quantum inspired area, we've been we've sort of come up with this new way of doing Boolean logic. And it's very interesting. It's this idea of invertible logic. And the way it works is in Boolean circuits, you may be familiar with, you know, the LSI design and Boolean circuits. You, you do things like, for example, uh, 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 multiplication circuits, okay? What you do is Boolean multiplication circuits out of AND gates and OR gates, and, and you give two inputs and it multiplies those two inputs. But if you do it in the same black box manner, but use p-bits and, and, and use you know, p-circuits for AND gates and OR gates, 
turns out, because of this graph nature of the P circuit, you can run the same problem in reverse. Okay, so what that means is your multiplier circuit becomes a good uh, uh, representation for a divider circuit or even a prime factorization circuit. And, and this has some significance because, you know, many of these problems are known to be computationally hard in one direction than the other. And the, the classic example is prime factorization where you can, you know, multiply any thousand digit numbers very, very easily, you know, right away. Uh, but, but to factor thousand digit numbers, you know, factor the product of 2000 digit uh, primes, for example, is, is very, very difficult. So invertible logic does not make those easy. It just makes, it just gives you the tools of the other side to design good cost functions to solve such difficult problems. Okay, so this is something we've looked at with, with, with PBITs. Now, more uh, traditional types of optimization problems. These are sometimes called combinatorial optimization problems, where you have uh, discrete variables and you're trying to uh, 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 optimize a cost function. And one famous example you may have heard of is this traveling salesman problem. Here I'm showing an example uh, in the state of California. You're trying to, let's say, visit 1,000 cities in the state of California, and you'd like to visit every city exactly once. So how long does an efficient trip take uh, for, 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 that, for that purpose? Okay, so this is actually a practical problem. And it's a, it's a nice uh, archetypical uh, problem of uh, these uh, combinatorial optimization problems. And in that case, for example, a thousand cities, if you do that, an efficient route seems to be about 15,000 miles. And such problems are naturally random. Okay, they have this natural randomness built in. So, therefore, they have, they admit a good, efficient, probabilistic representation with qubits. And these are things uh, we've looked at. Now, more interestingly, in, in, in recent times, we've also looked at this idea of quantum emulation with qubits. Now, this is not something we invented. It turns out, and if you're familiar with this, it's pretty obvious. But if you're not, it could sound a little bit interesting or, in fact, unbelievable, which is, you know, how can you simulate or emulate quantum systems with classical or probabilistic objects. Well, it turns out there's a class of quantum algorithms that admit efficient classical mappings, okay? And, and, and one system you may, have, you may be familiar with is the D-Wave system. And that system, for example, is one where it admits such efficient probabilistic mappings. And the idea is something like uh, the following. You have a qubit array and you represent it as a stack of qubits where, you know, these are uh, uh, interacting in the vertical dimension. And about if you, for example, for every qubit here, you may need about, let's say, 20 qubits or so. But if you do that, it turns out you can solve these quantum annealing problems by, uh, by qubits as well. And people have done this in software for many years. But if you, of course, have something like a scaled uh, uh, NTJ representation, for, for such problems, that, that's very good because then you can accelerate uh, things that D-Wave cannot do because D-Wave obviously has to live within the cryogenics uh, uh, boundary conditions, but for, for qubits, that's not a problem. In fact, the hotter the temperature, the better it is. Now, uh, in machine learning, uh, naturally stochastic things like Bayesian networks where you have correlated variables and you're asking for correlations between them or you're trying to sample from a given distribution. These again allow um, very nice efficient probabilistic mappings with P circuits and the much more difficult problem of learning can also be done uh, with, with probabilistic bits and for example the Boltzmann machine if you look at it the, the basic unit in the Boltzmann machine is what, what I'll call or what I'll define concretely as a P bit so that that can uh, have efficient probabilistic uh, maps as well. Okay, so this is a, just a general uh, view of the types of problems that are more difficult for uh, um, classical bits, but they may have better implementations with probabilistic bits. Okay, so let's make it a little bit concrete. So what do I mean by a P bit? Now, if you're familiar or coming from the machine learning literature, sometimes this is, you know, uh, sometimes you, you may have heard this idea of a binary stochastic neuron. Okay, so the P bit, I'll, I'll argue, is just a, hardware binary stochastic neuron, and it has an analog input, I sub i per qubit, and then a digital output, m sub i. And 
the, the behavior of the pivot is something like this. You, if the isobar is zero, then your output should produce a random bit stream with a 50-50 probability of plus ones and minus ones. Okay, that's, that's very simple. And if you change that I sub I from, let's say, a positive value or a negative value, what you're supposed to see is the change in the duty cycle of the bit stream. It's always binary. It's always plus one or minus one. But if you take a long time average, or if you have a bunch of, you know, collection of identical p bits, then you will see a change in this prefactor, uh, sorry, in this long time average which, which is looking at the probability of plus one or probability of minus one. And, and here I'm showing the same graph. I want you to focus on the blue trace first. That's just sweeping the eye from a, a large negative value to a large positive value. And you see how there's a fluctuating region in the middle and then you can pin the p bit to a plus value or to a minus value. And if you take a long time average, if you sit at one of those points and took the average, you see this uh, output average has the familiar shape of a hyperbolic tangent, which comes up in machine learning context. And sometimes we write this as mathematically right, like this. This is nothing complicated. It just draws the blue trace here. We're looking at the sign of a random number that is compared to this hyperbolic tangent of the analog input. Okay, so you can see that if tangent hyperbolic i is zero, you're looking at the sign of a random number between minus one and plus one, and that'll just produce this stream, for example. Okay, it's, it's very, very simple. Okay, so that's the p-bit, but how do I make a p-circuit, or what is a p-circuit, or what is a p-computer? Now, you take n of these units, p-bit one to p-bit n, and one to n n, and then you collect their digital outputs. You collect M1, M2, M3 as a digital vector, and you put it through this so-called synapse circuit, okay? This, this word, I don't like it very much, but it's taken from this um, neuromorphic literature. This has nothing to do with the biological synapse that people talk about in, in more you know, bio-inspired networks. Here, it just means that there is a feedback circuit which takes a weighted average of each of these units that we collected at the digital output, and it produces an analog input vector that is a weighted combination of these inputs. And in general, this function could be more complicated, but this, is, this happens to be the simplest one that admits a matrix multiplication uh, representation, so that's what people use very often. And for example, uh, Dr. Saima Siddiqui's talk gave an interesting spintronic way of building these, these synapses. You can go back and, and look at that. Uh, in this talk, we're going to treat it as a black box that can admit many different uh, um, hardware realizations. So you have the synapse circuit that collects all these outputs and produces an eye. And then you have this autonomous system then that those eyes go back to the inputs. And that, that changes the probability of producing a plus one or minus one at each of these ends, the, 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 the p bits, okay? So, so that's it. This is the general uh, architecture of a p computer. And every example, every application that I showed her in the earlier slide actually looks like, uh, can be realized in an architecture that looks like this. So it's worth saying a few words about this architecture because it's very different from what we're used to in digital computing. Number one, there is no clock here. There is no clock that synchronizes the operation of these p bits. And remember, these are random objects that will have random firing and random behavior. So uh, there is no synchronizing their behavior. This is a, an autonomous or clockless circuit. This synapse, in fact, could be a passive feedback unit. There is no, there is no clock in there either. It could just be a resistive network, for example. And because this is clockless, this architecture is massively parallel. What I mean by that is, if you put more and more pivots to the system, you increase the degree of parallelism because there is no clock. If you, have, if you measure performance by the number of flips this, this big chain is making, then it's actually increasing with the number of pivots. And this is very critical, and I'm going to come back to this point later. And finally, uh, there's one thing that the hardware people should know and the software pe people don't have an idea. And in fact, you, know, you can see these basic equations all over the place. 
but in hardware, you have to be aware of one thing, and, and that is this synapse, this black box that collects the outputs and produces an eye, that needs to be faster than the pivot. Okay, so what does that mean? Now, if you look at the circuit, there are two time scales you can identify. Number one, let's call it tau pivot or t pivot, and that's the time it takes to produce an N given an I. And there's another time scale, tau synapse, and that's the time it takes to produce an I given an N, okay? So the, the claim is tau synapse needs to be less than tau pivot. Now, why is that? And why does software not care about it, but hardware has to care about it? Well, in software, it turns out everything is clocked. So if you do this sequentially, things wait for each other anyway. So there is no race condition or time requirement that you need to satisfy. And in fact, if you solve these equations in software, in MATLAB or in your computer, for example, you don't discover this rule. You, you just, you, things work automatically, but you put it in hardware and you suddenly see the synapse needs to be faster. Now, this is a, a difficult thing, but the simplest explanation I can give is imagine you have two p-bits that are connected to one another. And let's say one of them flips. And before that information is routed to the next one, it flips again. You see, then the information that goes to the other pivot isn't up to date. And the pivots are in a way talking past each other. And this does not work. This does not get them to the right distribution that you program to go. You program them to go, okay? So this is a very, very important thing. And in these probabilistic graph models, this is some, one of the most uh, uh, stringent things because everything else is error tolerant, okay? Everything else, you can tolerate a lot of errors in the synapses, in the times, for example, you don't require this tau pivot to be uniform across the stack. They either can have random updates, the update order doesn't matter, but the synapse requirement has to be satisfied. Okay, so how do we build this uh, in, in, in hardware? And let's come to the Spintronics connection. And so remember, this is the basic building block that we're trying to implement. And uh, uh, for, for randomness, we looked at, you know, one of the simplest things you could do is to look at the physics of a ferromagnet. Okay, so I'd like to think of, you know, a simple, very simple toy model for a ferromagnet, let's say perpendicularly polarized, and it is separated. Let's say there are two states, up and down, red and blue, however you want to think of it. And uh, you separate these two states by about 40 kT or so. And, and this is what uh, uh, magneticians and you know, device engineers try very hard to do because you'd like your memory to be, you like your magnetic state to be non-volatile, right? And, and what is the idea? Well, you say something like, I have a retention time tau, which depends on, ex which exponentially depends on the energy barrier over kT. And then there's a prefactor that is material dependent which seems to be around picoseconds to nanoseconds. And if you put exponential 4D and multiply it with a nanosecond or a picosecond, you get some number of years, okay? So this is, this is how people sometimes justify why we need a 40 kT barrier to keep our uh, magnetization state stable. Now, if you, you know, the interesting thing about the exponential function, obviously, if you, if you reduce that to a kT, then the same, same formula uh, predicts that you're going to have a state that's fluctuating with picosecond to nanosecond time scales. So this is very interesting. And this formula doesn't hold when delta becomes much less than kT or comparable to kT. But I'm just trying to give you an idea what can happen in the presence of thermal noise when the barrier that separates these two states is, is small, okay? And, and uh, again, a related talk on this uh, super paramagnetic behavior of ferromagnets is Dr. Matthew Daniels' talk. Again, you can find it on the archives in the OSS webpage. So um, this, if, if, if this audience needs no introduction to the NTJ. We have a fixed layer, a free layer. The only thing I'll say is that if you replace the usual free layer with one of these stochastic items, then you can see a, a, you know, you have a fixed uh, a magnetic uh, state and then you have an unstable free layer. And as a function of time, you can see these very fast fluctuations in, in, in magnetic uh, uh, order, in magnetic order, which is turned into a resistance change. 
And this can be picoseconds to nanoseconds, depending on the magnet design. Now, this might be surprising. This is quite surprising, actually, because uh, most experiments to date uh, have seen maybe hundreds of microseconds or milliseconds of fluctuations here. And people think that, well, random walk is uh, slow, so random walk on the sphere for a perpendicular magnet must be slow. And, and how can you get such, and it has to be comparable to the alarm or frequency and so on. So, so how can you get such high, high speeds like picoseconds with you know, nothing going on? And we've written you know, a couple of papers with Dr. Jonathan Sun on this subject, on the theory of such uh, fluctuations. If you design your magnets in a special way, for example, in-plane magnets that are circular, then you can see very fast fluctuations, which are a little bit like processional switching, if you're familiar with that, that the thermal noise kicks the magnet out of plane and the magnet fluctuates around its own DMAG field. So this is quite fascinating and different, but I don't believe there's any experimental uh, report of that uh, at the moment. Uh, but it can be very fast. And as I'll, I'll explain later, this, this fluctuation time is very important for us because the faster the fluctuation, the faster the computation will be. In this case, these fluctuations are very, very useful. Now, let me uh, bring this uh, thing from, uh, uh, bring up this collaboration from Tohoku University that we had with colleagues at Peru. So, you know, as you know, Hideo Ono and Shunsuke Fukami from Tohoku University, they're world experts on designing these perpendicular MTJs. And when we approached them, uh, they, they told us that they could reliably uh, get these fluctuations by just changing the thickness of the PMA layers, right? Because as you know, in this interfacial PMA uh, magnets, you can change the anisotropy, the surface anisotropy by changing the thickness of the ferromagnet. And if you increase it, you can adjust it in a way that makes the barrier less stable and less coercive. And, and this is what you're seeing here on the top right, an experimental uh, uh, trace, which is as a function of the coiffed thickness you can see that as the thickness is increasing, the fluctuations are becoming faster and faster. And as I mentioned, we've seen these fluctuations in the lab, maybe um, up to hundreds of microseconds or so, but not faster. And it's a, a really, uh, a, to me, it's an amazing thing to have a normal two terminal resistance. You put the scope on it, you measure its resistance, and you see it changes from 10K to 20K and 10K again. And it's a very interesting object. And uh, as I said, Matt Daniels also has applications using this object, computing applications. You can check that out if you're interested. Now, how do you, but this is still a two terminal resistance. Uh, how do you turn this into a P-bit? that looks like this. How, how do we get that? Because this is an electrical device that we're going to uh, connect, interconnect with one another. Now for that, we look at uh, STTM map, right? And once again, this audience needs no introduction to it. Uh, uh, STTM map is this uh, non-volatile memory technology. And uh, uh, the basic idea is you have a stable MTJ, which is attached to a transistor. And this is the so-called 1T1 MTJ cell of the STTM technology. And I'm you know, very surprised to uh, hear, uh, or, uh, which is an, you know, with this amazing development of this memory technology. This past year in IEDM, there were two separate demonstrations of one gigabit MRAM technology, which means that they've already integrated one billion such units on chip. So this, this technology has come a long way since the discovery of you know, GMR followed by TMR and everything else, right? So that's, that's quite an amazing thing. But the good news is this is a scale technology that if we find a way to build qubits out of this, there's great promise to get massively parallel, very big uh, probabilistic circuits. At least that's what I'll argue. So how do you turn this into a pivot? Well, you can guess the first step, which is to make the MTJ unstable. And the second step is we change the structure a little bit. Instead of one T1 MTJ, we add an inverter here. And an inverter is just two more transistors, okay? This is just a compact notation for an NMOS and a PMOS that is attached to the drain of this transistor, or of the first transistor. So how does, what, what happens if you do this? Now remember, the input is the input gate voltage to the transistor. And then you have an output which is collected at the output of the inverter. Now, if you solve this 
using you know realistic real life uh, uh, transistor models as well as stochastic LLG as a function of the V in, which is this input transistor voltage. And then you see the output of the inverter, V out, and you, you sweep the input voltage in the background and slowly look at what's happening at this node, you'll see something like this, large fluctuations, and then it dies down just like our ideal behavioral equations. Okay, so let's stop here for a second and observe differences. First of all, what just happened? How does this work? So you can understand two limits immediately, which is when the transistor is off, which, is, which means that it's closer to minus VDD half here, the negative supply. A transistor, when it's off, it has a very large resistance, okay? In fact, the on-off ratio is so much better than an NTJ. You get gigaohms of resistance here. So what happens is this is an open circuit now. So VDD is inverted by the inverter. So you get a zero at the output here. Okay, because there's a high voltage here, the transistor is off, and then you, that's converted to a low voltage here. That's the one limit. And let's examine the other limit. When the transistor is on, its resistance is very small compared to the MTJ. So what that means is now you, instead of having this open circuit here, now you shorted the drain, and that's very close to the minus VDD half. And what does the inverter do? Well, it inverts it again. So yeah, that's why you see a positive output at the inverter. So we understand the two limits. Now what happens in the middle is when this, in, this transistor resistance is comparable to the average RP, RAP state of the magnetic tunnel junction, then you see large fluctuations at this drain node. And that's what gives you these large fluctuations. And, and this was an idea that was suggested to us. We were, just to give you, you know, back up and give you a little story, we we're looking for all sorts of probabilistic bits. And I think uh, Professor Saif Salahuddin at some point mentioned, you know, why don't you just take the 1T1 MTJ and, 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 and use an unstable magnet like this? And we realized, yes, that, that, that works very nicely. This was first proposed as a, and we wrote a joint paper together. And, this was proposed uh, uh, as a theoretical result in, in EDL in 2017. And as I mentioned recently, we've asked for these stochastic MTJs from uh, Professor uh, uh, Ono and Fukami, and, and they've given us uh, these MTJs and we built this in the lab, okay? They sent us these two, MT, two terminal MTJs and we put together them on a PCB. And this is actually experimental, an experimental measurement, the 10 second average of this circuit is a function of V in and V out. And you can see at different voltages, there's, this should be a volt. There's uh, at different voltages you see, uh, we have this controlled tunable randomness that we defined as our, uh, our hardware uh, pivot. And one thing you can note is the time scale, as I mentioned. And we had faster MTJ. These are, these are as you can see, around fluctuating around you know, milliseconds, maybe a couple of milliseconds or a few milliseconds time scales. And we had faster MTJs, but as I told you in the beginning, we needed fast, even faster synapses. So in the first experiment, we were we kept to the slow MTJs just to make sure everything works. Okay, and and this is our PCB where we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight MTJs. And the the the, the, the if you look if you follow this vertical line, MTJ, NMOS, and a source resistance. That's basically the circuit, okay? That's basically the circuit. And then there are these comparators. Now, instead of using two inverters, as I you know, showed in the previous slide, here we wanted to make sure the amplifiers were good. So that's why we use comparators. So the comparator is really a stand-in for the inverter that was uh, originally proposed, okay? So, so we have eight of these circuits, and I, I, this is exactly the same architecture that I showed, this general, uh, um, uh, architecture I showed uh, in the, in the uh, beginning, okay? And uh, what about the synapse? Well, for the synapse, we just use the microcontroller here. And as I mentioned, there are Spintronic, CMOS, Membristive, Capacitive, all sorts of uh, 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 synapse implementations that are being discussed in the literature. For the moment, we thought, okay, let's keep it simple and just use a microcontroller. But as I mentioned, this is this is an active area of research and that actually complements what we are doing here because we're giving a nice uh, compact threshold, electrical threshold in function. 
And the synapse is programmable. So you can go and change the synapse, which changes the connections between the pieces, so you can solve different problems. So let me now show you. So I'm just telling you that this uh, uh, PCB is really the same architecture you show, uh, I showed you earlier. So now let's talk about what we did with this circuit. Okay. So this is our 8-pibit computer. This is the architecture. We have 8-pibit. We collect the output N. The synapse calculates a function I that is routed back to each one, each and every one of these pibits. And we let this system evolve and it does something useful. So, okay, so what does it do? We took an algorithm. We applied this to the problem of factorization. Okay, and, and this is just an algorithm that is borrowed and modified from the field of this adiabatic quantum computation. In AQC, that's the you know, acronym for that field. In AQC, what they do is they define, for example, a cost function like this, E, and then they say that, uh, for example, you're trying to factor a number F, and you're saying that, okay, I have inputs X and Y. So suppose I you know, express this X and Y as binary, uh, Boolean variables. This is just a binary representation of a number, of a, of a p-digit uh, number. And what you say is, if you're trying to factor the number f, use a cost function and define it as xy minus f squared. So what does this do? Well, what this does is, is very simple. If xy is equal to f, this is zero, obviously. And for anything else, this is more than zero. So this is a cost function. You see, that is very easy to write. You immediately, and, and this, this is a very deep topic that goes to NP completeness and NP hardness. You see, it's easy to recognize the right answer. If you give me the right XY, I can easily tell you you found it because, you know, because E in that case is zero, but it's very difficult to find the X and Y. Okay, that's, that, and that's why this problem is by no means easy, and this is an optimization problem in general. So you have these discrete variables and you're trying to minimize this E. So how do you come up with the synapse circuit, how do you come up with the interconnections of your circuit so that the circuit will automatically try to minimize this E? And there's a, a trick for that. And the trick is, you may not be surprised, you take the derivative of the cost function with, with respect to your input variables. And if you, you, you of course have the minus derivative because you're trying to minimize the uh, cost function. And this I sub I becomes your synapse function. Okay, so the microcontroller then is a one-time operation. You easily calculate this derivative, send it to the microcontroller, and you're set. So what happens next? What happens next is you first need to calibrate this system as in any experimental system, right? So in the x-axis here, you're seeing different possibilities for the x-factor here, the x-factor of the product. And that in the and, and, and f is a fixed number. Remember, f is f is something like nine hundred and forty-five. And on the uh, on the y-axis, you, uh, you see the possibilities for y. Okay. And what you try to do is you take a ten, fifteen, and this circuit is constantly fluctuating. If you if you measure the outputs of each of these pivots, they are always fluctuating. But in the beginning, you take a ten-second average and you try to ensure there is a nice grass-like probability distribution, which is of equal height. Because in the beginning, you don't put any synapse to them. In the beginning, they're just random numbers with uh, uh, zero connection. So that's why they're, they're uncorrelated. So this is your calibration step. But after the calibration, you turn on the circuit and you take the same 10, 20 second average and you see the system spends most of its time in the correct factors 16 times 15 for this, for this example. And we tried this with many other factors and in fact with, with different cost functions. So this is a natural uh, stochastic annealer, if you will. And that goes, that tries to minimize this energy as a function of time and it works with no clocks. It works just like how nature minimizes energy, okay? So this is what we did and as I mentioned, this uh, factorization is, is an incidental example of a large class of optimization problems where you have a discrete cost function and you're trying to find uh, uh, input states that minimize 
that cost function. And this is a circuit that does it naturally. And, and we think that the promise is really in the integration and in the possible scalability of such a computer. Okay, so, um, you know, it is important to compare anytime you come up with, you know, Spintronics is cool, we are among friends here, and Spintronics is something that we all like, but when you try to do something like this, there's always, you always need a good argument for why this is any better than our existing technology. And, and I think that there's a, a genuinely good answer to that question. So, and there are two aspects to that question. And, and, and one aspect is the device level comparison. So I talked about this analog input digital output unit, hardware unit that I call the qubit. And remember, qubit is an abstraction. So you may have, based on you know, the material system you know, you may have a better uh, qubit implementation. But the idea is a tunably random unit that can be connected to drive uh, other, other such units. Okay? And we think that that building block is useful for many, many different applications because lots of things uh, benefit from randomness. The realization I talked about is this MTJ-based realization. And if you look at it, it requires three transistors and an MTJ. So that's quite a compact unit to, to, to uh, build a function like this. And just to give you an idea, just to draw a first comparison uh, with digital CMOS, how you would do this with digital CMOS is something like this. You would use the so-called um, LFSR, which is, you know, a, a long acronym, linear feedback shift register. That's just a bunch of registers or flip-flops that are connected to one another in the cyclic manner. And it's an you know, interesting mathematical observation is if you XOR some of these outputs and feed it back to the uh, shift register, that seems to produce a very random looking bit streams. Okay, this is an idea that people use in as, as, as pseudo random number generators. And what that means is, of course, this being a deterministic CMOS circuit, after a while you'll see a period, but for a long time, you can get uh, random looking signals and that's called an LFS, LFSR and that's a pseudo random number generator. And this is one way if you go to your FPGA, if you, or if you uh, uh, ask for a random number or long random numbers from your computer, you most likely use some variant of such a, such a unit, such a circuit. And so how do you build this? Well, we did a transistor level design of this, okay? We, we said that 32-bit is a, is a good length LFSR and 32-bit, uh, 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 okay, you might ask why 32 bits? I'll come back to that. But let's say we have a 32-bit LFSR and we're just looking at the LFSR, okay? We're not looking at the activation function and the comparator to make this tunable. So I'm just looking for a random stream at 50-50 probability at this point. And that requires about 1194 transistors. And the reason I'm keeping all these digits here is because this is not a very long design. I actually can count, uh, account for all those transistors in there. That's why it's 1194. You use, you use a standard E flip plot, you use all the XORs, and it's not computerized, it's actually hand designed. So it uh, immediately tells you that, okay, you're doing something very expensive, usually digitally, with something that is much smaller. And uh, when the area is small, you see energy is also small. And, and in this case, energy per random bit is about 10x smaller than what this uh, LFSR unit would use. And I'd like to argue this is a conservative analysis because firstly, we didn't include, you know, if you're doing this professionally, you would worry about parasitics, clock power, interconnects, repeaters, all sorts of additional junk comes in. Uh, which is not true for the MTJ based design because there's just not that many transistors. So this uh, real number is probably much bigger. And secondly, I'm just looking at the uh, uh, LFSR here, the red box, just to get a random bit stream. The tunability I was talking to you earlier about isn't included in this analysis. And finally, um, you know, uh, you might ask, okay, if you didn't use a 32 bit LFSR, but a 16 bit LFSR, you would have halved the number of these transistors. But you see, the problem is if you reduce your LFSR too much, you get repeating periods very quickly. To give you an idea, if you have a 16-bit LFSR, you get two to the, at, at your best case, 
you get two to the 16 different bit streams, uh, um, um, uh, bits. If you have an 8-bit LFSR, you only get 256 and they get repeated. They, get, they start repeating each other. So you need a decent LFSR size because your randomness is not true. Unlike the MTJ, which literally operates with a truly random thermal noise, which is, uh, uh, which is not the case here. So this is device-level analysis. And let me show you in my, now I have two more slides. So let me show you another very important thing, this architecture level comparison that I briefly mentioned in the beginning. Now, this is our architecture, remember, and we have, and I, I said in the beginning something like if I double the number of qubits in this design, the architecture becomes more efficient. So why is that? Well, the reason is they're the key metric in such a probabilistic annual, and this is true for all sorts of Ising machines that, that you may have heard of. The key metric is number of flips per second. You have an n bit chain, and you need to iterate this chain, and you need to iterate this chain about a million times or so before that chain uh, uh, mixes in, in, that, in that terminology, or it equilibrates. And then you can get good samples, or, and then you can optimize your cost function, and so on and so forth. Now, I put something in parentheses, you may have noticed number of informed flip, flip flips per second. So why does it have to be informed? Well, remember, the synapse needs to be fast. Okay, if the synapse is not fast, you're not informed. Everybody is talking randomly, it doesn't work. So that's a key important requirement. Okay, but then you might ask, fine, how many flips do I need to solve a problem? Well, remember, that's an algorithm dependent and a, and a, and a problem dependent uh, answer. If you have a difficult problem, computationally hard problem, you may need one billion flips. If you have an easier problem, you may need one million flips. But in any case, whatever you do, you like a faster tau knot. You like more flips per second because that sets the real time. What can be done in two days, if you can do it in two minutes, uh, for example, in machine learning, you keep hearing about how it takes, you know, uh, six months to do stochastic gradient descent. If you can do it in six days, that's a huge improvement, irrespective of any algorithmic speed up. Okay, that's the point. So let me calibrate you to real numbers. Here's what you can do with state-of-the-art GPU and CPU today. And these are, uh, this is 10 to the 12 flips per second. Now, it's an amazing number because remember, the clock speed of your CPU is around a gigahertz or so. So what that means is it, it 10 to the 12 flips per second is a thousand spin flips per clock cycle. So how does this work? Well, people optimize these things very, very hard. They reduce the codes, they use parallelization, they use multiple stacks of GPUs and CPUs, and this is what state of the art seems to be. And what can be possible with an MTJ-based uh, circuit, and that's why we think Spintronics has a real shot here, is that it's something like this. So suppose you have one million qubits, and suppose they can fluctuate with sub nanosecond, let's say 100 picosecond time scales. Remember, this is projected and not experimentally seen yet. Uh, but if they're all parallel, is flipping in parallel, like I mentioned, this massively parallel system, then you could have something like 10 to the 16 flips per second. So it could get you to regions where you cannot do, do, do certain problems with classical computers, but a 10 to the 4 speed up like this unlocks regimes where lots of interesting things are possible for all, for, for all these different problems. Now, uh, you may say, okay, you know, uh, why not 1 billion uh, uh, qubits? Because you mentioned there's 1 gigabit MRAM implementations already. Well, I mean, we think we're going to run into a power wall, area wall, or an inter interconnect wall as you try to put so many of these units on chip. So, so the, the, the real answer, I don't know uh, where it is, but 1 million we think is fairly conservative and it's possible. Okay, so this is the last slide. Um, uh, I talked about this probabilistic computing as something in between bits and qubits with natural applications to machine learning and quantum computing. And as I said, qubit is an abstraction, so you can implement it, you know, we, on our own, we've implemented qubits with FPGA, you know, CMOS ASIC uh, uh, is a possibility. MRAM based is, is, is something that is very interesting because of because this, uh, of this natural noise the MTJ is providing, and even other emerging devices, different material systems that are stochastic, whose randomness can be controlled, these can enable better qubits. And um, as I mentioned, there is a possibility of beating classical computers, you know, jokingly, maybe a classical supremacy region, 
where you can solve problems where uh, that, that, is, that is difficult or hard to, to, to unlock with, with classical bits. So a uh, final uh, uh, thought, which problems or algorithms can we accelerate? Well, uh, look for an actually stochastic ones. Okay, that's the, that's the final thought I'd like to leave you with. And machine learning and optimization are full of examples. So uh, with that, I'd like to conclude. And once again, uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Karim, for this uh, very interesting talk. So we can now take questions. Uh, if you're in Zoom, use the raise hand feature in the participants panel. Um, if you can't find it, send me a private chat message. First question, uh, Mark, please go ahead. Uh, thank you for the very nice uh, talk. Uh, right at the end, you talked about um, getting uh, 10 to the fourth more flips per second than you get in CMOS. Uh, my question is, since you have this inverter, aren't you getting a CMOS flip with each of the MTJ flips? So then how do you beat the CMOS limit in, since you have to make use of the CMOS also? Yeah, thanks Mark. This is a very interesting, uh, important question. Now we assume here the P for this 10 to the 16 number, the assumption relies on two things, which is that two undemonstrated things, which is you need to put 1 million pivots in, in, in a chip and each of these magnets give you about 100 picoseconds of autocorrelation or fluctuation time. Now 100 picoseconds is already bigger than your inverter speed. So, so that's not the bottom because inverter speed is around, you know, four or five picoseconds, maybe less. So here the dominating time factor is really the fluctuation time of the magnet, which is 0.1 nanoseconds here. Now, if you could design, so, so how do you beat CMOS? Well, the MTJ gives you the randomness for which there is no easy uh, uh, CMOS unit. If you could find the CMOS, you know, if you could, and, and this is very plausible, I'm not saying there is no way, that if you could find an object that gives you a naturally fluctuating 0.1 nanosecond autocorrelation time, then you, you could put those objects in parallel and still get something like this. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Mark. Okay, next question, Advait, please go ahead. Uh, hey, Karim, uh, thank you for the really nice talk. I hope you're enjoying um, Harold Frank Hall and the beach. Um, <laughs> Um, 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 so basically, the uh, the question here is: uh, you mentioned initially that the synaptic time constant has to be um, faster than the yes. p-bit time constant, yes. and um, yet it seems like the p-bits have a high current drive requirement, and therefore um, it would seem like it would take more energy or more sort of like basically, it, it, I mean the time constant of being able to steer a current is would be larger than the time constant of flipping a tiny attofarad capacitor at, in some inverter so i don't i'm do you see the question i'm not sure if i'm if i've articulated it correctly no no i think you raised uh, an excellent point so let me rephrase it to see if you agree and to maybe make others uh, understand the question because it's very important so the point is if your p-bit, which is a C output, is a single inverter, is driving some large capacitance, how are you going to control the, uh, because this also relates to Mark's question, which is, you know, I, I said something like inverter flips in only a few nanos, a few picoseconds, which is, you know, safely less than 100 picoseconds. Now, Advait's question is, yeah, but if you have a large fan out, that's going to depend on the output capacitance you're driving, which is absolutely correct. So, I should have qualified, I am qualifying now that the pivot output fan in needs to be controlled in such a way that just like in normal VLSI circuits, you don't let that fan out diverge on you. You, have, you can only support maybe three or four neighbors or five neighbors. And that also reduces the output capacitance you're driving. Okay, and this is maybe in contrast with what we're used to in you know, some of these machine learning uh, accelerators where you have all-to-all -all neighbors, but we believe 
that if you're going to put 1 million qubits on chip anyway, all to all is just uh, not going to be possible. So the, the answer to the question is you're right. And the fan-in needs to be limited so that synapse can cope. And if the fan-in is limited, then synapse doesn't need to be faster than everyone's update, only those that are connected to you, right? So, so limiting the fan-in helps not only reduce the capacitance, which is related to your question. And another thing, if you're not connected to another pivot, this, th this doesn't become an issue because you're, you're, you don't need their up-to-date information to update yourself. So limiting the synapse, uh, the fan out is absolutely essential, which, is, which, which I'm glad you brought up. Awesome, thank you. Thanks, thanks, Arvind. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm gonna read a question from Twitch for you. Uh, how does the performance of this um, um, MTJ based device depend on the TMR ratio? I suppose an unstable free layer of MTJ gives a poor TMR. Uh, could you please comment on that? Right. So uh, one of the pleasant, so let me, let me say yeah, that two, two questions, I guess, or, or one question and one comment. The question is, how does the TMR ratio affect the performance of the pivot? And maybe I can uh, quickly scroll through and, and go back to the basic device here. So a pleasant surprise is you don't need a, a heroic TMR here. For example, this, this is, you know, one thing you'll note, which I, I, I didn't mention is this ideal behavior and this simulated behavior doesn't seem to be completely on, on, on the same footing because you see not, I'm not going always rail to rail. This sort of has that analog flavor we don't like. You know, ideally, this always goes, if there's a fluctuation, it should go rail to rail, but that's not just pos that's not possible with modern CMOS. It's just that you need 50 millivolts or so swing at the, at the any time your magnet flips, you need at least a 50 millivolt swing, which is around, you know, if you want to think in terms of, you know, physical parameters, it's a few kT over Q, okay? You, you need a few kT over Q to flip this invert, inverter rail to rail. So how does this relate to the question of TMR? Well, if you can't give 50 millivolts of fluctuations here because of poor TMR, then this device is not going to work. But the good news is, even with a uh, TMR of 100%, I think this, this is, this looks fairly good. And if you simulate circuits with that behavior, it actually works. It gets you to the right distribution to the extent that our empirical experiments uh, tell us. So this actually uses maybe 100% or so TMR. Okay? You don't need this huge heroic TMR. And the second comment is uh, the low burial will affect the TMR. I'm not sure I agree with that. I mean, there are experts here who can comment, but the experimental I mean, I see the magnetic uh, uh, three layer behavior. I mean, there, of course there's probably uh, deep connections, but uh, first of all, this is not the experimental experience. We've seen, you know, uh, Tohoku's MTJs when they were stable, they were at around the same TMR when they became unstable. So maybe that's the cleanest answer. And I view TMR as a sort of a transport property rather than a magnetism property. So, but, but you know, uh, other people can chime in if, if, if they like. But experimentally, that's not what, what seems uh, to be at this point. Thank you, Karim. I hope that uh, answers the question. Um, any further questions or comments in Zoom or in Twitch? Please raise your hand if you have a question. Doesn't look like that's the case. So let's thank Karim again for this interesting talk.